I'm going to start my timer. There we go. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about some fancy LED panels and how I managed to get these working. Uh, so first of all, hi, I'm Ita. Um, it's lovely to meet you all. I'm... What? Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Very professional. Great start. Oh, yeah, I've got to try and find the mouse now. <laughs> uh... No? How about... Welcome to my talk on advanced alt tabbing. Um, <laughs> yes, let's start that again. Hi, I'm Ita. Uh, lovely to meet you all. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade, uh, but nothing in my job is at all related to what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I've also been heading up the GSM network this year, if anyone's used that. So I've been here since Tuesday doing that. It's been a long week. We're all very tired. Anyway, that's me. That's my web address. Um, this is a 78 by 78 pixel color LED panel. This is basically a mini screen. Uh, that green thing you can see on the slides is the bit of hardware that I built to make it light up. And this talk is about what these panels are and how I made that. Um, so first of all, what are these things? Uh, we got them from a company called DigiLED. Uh, they had like a batch they wanted to get rid of. Um, the, they weren't performing. They weren't meeting expectations. They took them all out of service uh, and then just had them lying around. So someone from our hack space came over and just picked up a bunch in the van. They have lots of tiny little lights in them uh, that can light up any color to show an image, like your computer screen. Uh, for comparison, though, your computer screen has like 1920 by 1080 pixels for like an HD image, uh, and this is 78 by 78. So it's really quite small. And in fact, uh, originally they were designed to be in one of these. This is part of a DigiLED iMAG R screen, which has four of those panels all connected up together in this lovely aluminium frame with power and data connections and everything all nice and beautiful. And you're supposed to put them together to make a wall like this, uh, similar to what you might see on like Piccadilly Circus or on an ad screen on a highway. Uh, and the manufacturer would tell you how to get all this done. Um, they'd provide instructions, they'd provide help. And at the end, you just have a nice, easy HDMI cable to plug into, like on your monitor at home. So really, the panels themselves are individual components. If you're buying and using the system, someone will have set them up for you to present as one big screen already. Uh, we didn't have any of that. We just had the panels on their own. Basically, it's e-waste. Uh, and we, they figured we'd be able to get them working ourselves. They did give us some documentation, so we're not completely blind, but yeah. Um, so, now that we know what we're up against, uh, I decided to start by seeing if I could just get anything to display at all. So far, I just had a totally black panel like this, so I wanted to see if it worked at all. You can actually buy some custom-built cards from this, from this amazingly branded ledcontrollercard.com and other Chinese manufacturers. Um, so yeah, we got some of these to start testing with. Um, this wasn't me. This was another friend at the Hackspace. Um, they have a charming, poorly translated UI, which is very confusing, very difficult to make sense of, only runs on Windows. But we did find an option to make the module on by smart settings. I'm like, yes, I love that. I want to make the module on. Let's go. Um, unfortunately, uh, it didn't quite work. Um, we got some picture. It was a bit distorted. Uh, that, right, that thing on the right there, that's supposed to be one solid stripe, not two. Um, we did prod this with logic analyzer for a bit, but we didn't really get anywhere. So eventually, we just decided to start from first principles, basically. Uh, if we took, take a look at the back of one of these things, there's a mess of various components. There's a power connector. Um, but most importantly, there's this rather scary looking 30 pin header that is labeled for us. This looks, a bit, this looks a bit scary. It's difficult to figure out what all of this means. Um, if you do some research online about LED panels, some of the names on here start to look a bit familiar. So like OE and LAT, if you've done stuff before, maybe those look familiar as output enable and latch maybe. And you've got sort of you know, some data lines. There's a pseudo standard for LED panels called Hub75 uh, that maybe we think these might follow. So Short of any other ideas, we just like connected them all up uh, with this like piece of ribbon cable, wired it up to a test microcontroller, saw if we could get anything to display at all. Um, uh, however, we can't get it working at all. Uh, literally, nothing is displaying. Um, and so, one 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 idea is that like this is really annoying to wire. Um, you have got like 30 connections, and you've got to wire them all by hand. Uh, if you're doing this on a breadboard, it really sucks. So maybe we made a parallax error. Maybe we just misconnected one of the wires. But we eventually looked at the data sheet, uh, which we did have. Um, and this is like a table of stuff. But some of the stuff says, oh, look, the supply voltage is between 4 and 5, five basically 5 volts. And the input voltage is 0 0.7 times that, which is 3.5 volts. And if you've done stuff with microcontrollers before, you'll know a lot of them run on 3.3 volts. Um, so we can't actually output. The, the signals our microcontroller was sending were not actually powerful enough to, or like the voltage was not high enough for the panel to actually recognize anything. So we've basically just been yelling into the dark. Um, 
So that's annoying. We're going to need to converge to fix that. Um, and at this point, we've got like 30 connections to make. Uh, if we add like a logic level converter, that's 60 because we've got to go from you know, 30 from the thing to the converter and the converter to the thing. Um, so that's a big pain. Um, so in the end, I just made a printed circuit board. You might think this is like way overkill, um, but I really just didn't want to run the risk of like spending hours debugging a, a, a wrong connection. Uh, this took an afternoon to make in KiCad, which is a great open source like PCB design suite, um, which you know you might think this is like really impressive, but like if you've done a bunch of these, it actually really is not so bad. Um, and so, and also thanks to the likes of JLC PCB and other houses in China, you can get this delivered in a week for just 30 pounds. So that like at this point, it's like that's obviously. It. Then I don't have to worry about like miswiring stuff. So you just get that delivered. We solder, we solder it up, um, and here's everything that we have on this lovely board. We've got a Pi Pico, which is a uh, microcontroller for, for development. We've got our three logic level shifters. We've got a debug port to program the Pico, and we've got two output headers that match up with what we're expecting to see on the panel. So we just plug this in and go. So after doing all that, we can get them to display something. Um, this isn't really, you know, that's that's like, well, it lights up. It's got some fun panel. It's got some fun patterns. Uh, we can make it do some more fun patterns if we tweak the code a bit. But so we have a fancy development board. We can get it to light up uh, again, assuming it works like a Hub 75 board. Um, but we really don't have much control over what exactly it's doing. Like we have some example code that we've just copied from somewhere. We, we, we've completed our mission of getting it to light up, um, but and now we have to actually understand how we drive this properly. So it's time for a short theory interlude. Um, let's simplify things. Instead of having 78 by 78, uh, let's have 3 by 3 pixels. So we're going to have 9 pixels total, nice, easy 3 by 3 grid to sort of give you uh, an idea of, of how these things work. Um, if you were to control each pixel individually, uh, we'd need nine wires, um, one, for each, one for each pixel. Now, that's a lot, because we have to connect those all to the microcontroller or whatever we're doing to, to, drive, uh, to drive the panel. And so we would want to reduce that, uh, that number of connections. So what we can do is we can stick a magic box in the middle that reduces that nine number down to five. And this magic box is called a demultiplexer. Uh, how this magic bit of kit works is if you see uh, those top three lines over there, these ones in red, um, what it will do is, depending on what you put on those bottom two lines, it will connect that to one of the rows in our 3x3 three three panel. So you can see here it's connecting the top row, it can also connect the middle row, or you know maybe the bottom row even if you're feeling a bit spicy. Um, and that's all dependent on the value of those two address lines. So you've got three lines for one row, and you've got two lines at the bottom for choosing which row to light up. Um, if you find this like electrical diagram that I totally made in KiCad confusing, here's a less confusing uh, box diagram. So we've got once again you know, three inputs for our one row, a address of which uh, line to display, which I'm going to call a scan line uh, as well, our demultiplexer, oops, sorry, um, and then that's going to drive the whole panels. Here, that is in text form if you prefer to. Uh, use text to understand things. Yeah, basically a simple panel, 3 by 3 uh, 9 pixels. It's impractical to control all of them separately because there's too many connections. Um, we also have to bear in mind that, you know, beyond the realms of our simple example, we also have RGB, so we've got actually three color channels to deal with. And we can use a demultiplexer to only send one row at a time using the address lines to choose which one. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute. Um, you said we were going to control the whole panel, but you've just lit up individual rows. Well, there's this really fun thing about the human eye that it turns out if you do this really, really quickly and just light up all the rows in sequence over and over again, the human eye doesn't notice a difference. Um, but if you've ever tried to take a photograph of one of those LED panel advertising boards, you might have found it very difficult because cameras do. So this is the reason why you might have had difficulty trying to photograph such things. Um, but anyway, if we're going to scale this up to the real panel, um, we have our one row with three inputs, you know, the same diagram as before. Um, and if we, if we scale beyond 3x3 three three to a 78x78 78 78, uh, panel, uh, the one row we need as an input into our demultiplexer is now 78 inputs, which is quite a lot, uh, even more than sort of than 3 and 5. So we, we, we've still achieved a significant saving, uh, but this still isn't good enough. So we need something else, right? This is too many inputs. 
Um, and so the solution the panel manufacturers come up for this is to give the panel a bit of memory um, to have it be able to hold on to stuff. And one of the chips they use for this is called a shift register, which you may be familiar with. And this only has two inputs, and this is great. So you might think, how the hell can I drive uh, 98, uh, 98 uh, sorry, 78 pixels with only two inputs? Well, here's a, like a, a diagram that I made to try and substantiate this a bit for you. Um, I've represented the shift register over here with just like a table with four cells of memory. Um, the shift registers have two inputs, uh, data and clock. And how they work is when the clock changes from a low to a high, the thing that is in data gets put into the left-hand side of the shift register and everything else kind of just shuffles over a bit. And if there's some data that needs to fall out the end, that just happens. Um, so here's an amazing animation that took me not actually that long. <laughs> you can see the clock goes to high, data gets put into the shift register. Return the clock to low again, put the next bit of data in, this time a one, and it shuffles over again. Um, and so you can see we can keep doing this. I mean, you can eventually fill up our shift register here full of four things. And you can see how this can be extended to let you sort of clock in an entire row of 78 using only two connections. Um, on our panel, the, the shift register type thing we use is actually this fancy chip called MBI 5153, but more on that later. Um, and so we can, we can modify our diagram here, and we can add our sort of shift register type chip, and this brings the number of inputs we need down back to two, which is very nice. So if you're a bit confused, here's a recap of all that theory I just went over. Um, on the big panel, uh, controlling all 78 by 78 pixels is quite impossible, so the panels don't make you do that. Instead, they use a demultiplexer and shift registers. The demultiplexer means you only have to worry about one row at a time, um, and you can choose which row with the address lines. Uh, and the shift register means we can send a lot of data with only two inputs, data and clock, because it holds on to the previous pixels, we're letting our shift in more. And actually, on our panel, the MBI5153 chips will let us hold a whole frame's worth. So that's really nice. Um, so now that we have an understanding of how the panels work, we can move on to trying to sort of control them more fully. Um, can, we, can we actually write some programs to control every pixel and put whatever we want on the panels? I'm going to try and drink some water. This is going to be very deft. Wow, I managed to open it without spilling it. Go me. This is the content you came here for. Right, <laughs> moving on. So, um, now that we have this understanding, um, we can go ahead and label or sort of understand this 30-pin uh, header a bit better. These lines A through E are demultiplexer inputs, so that chooses the scan line, the address line that's getting fed into the demultiplexer. These things R1 through B4 are shift register inputs that have a shared clock, so they all share the same clock. Um, you might think, hang on a second, you just mentioned there are two. Why are there 12? The reason for that is because two things. One, the panel is actually broken up into four smaller mini panels that are each 20 lines tall. Uh, we lose two lines at the end of the last one. And uh, each MBI5153 only does one grayscale frame. So actually, we need three of them, three chains of them for red, green, and blue. So that's where the 12 comes from. Um, there's also some funky stuff here. There's a playback clock, and there are some control commands. And this is a bit, this is a bit interesting, especially if you've used other LED panels. Um, this uh, MBI5153 chip that the panels use is quite wonderful. It has a bunch of fun features. We can send it an entire frame, and we're not just sending it whether the pixels are off or on. We can actually choose an intensity per pixel, so it, it will do dimming for us. Um, so it'll hold on to all that data, and then it will play it back for us at a frequency we determine. It'll even do this for two frames. There's this like, great diagram from the data sheet that shows you can read stuff into one of its memory banks while it's playing out the other and then you like, swap it over by doing a vertical sync command, and then uh, it will start clocking out the other one. So in short, to control our panel properly, we, we only need to load a whole frame of data into the MBI5153's memory, and then play back that frame while switching the demultiplexer's address line. So we're going to tell the MBI5153 to play back uh, the thing we just sent into it, and as it's doing that, we're going to be controlling the demultiplexer for it to make sure that what it's sending lines up with the line we're trying to display. So in diagrammatic form, we're going to build a red box that talks to both the MBI5153 and the scan line uh, and, and the demultiplexer over there. So how do we do that? Well, 
there's a nice piece of documentation called the application note. Uh, and if you've done sort of electronics -y stuff before, uh, the difference between a data sheet and an application note is the data sheet tells you kind of what the thing is, and this is actually a guide on how to use it um, that is surprisingly helpful uh, if also poorly translated. Um, it has some great headings. Uh, we've got the setting of configuration register. We've got the setting of grayscale. And we've also got send data and display image. Um, fascinating. So translated into stuff you might be able to understand. The first section is about uh, just telling it how big the panel is, um, how, how many sort of rows it has, so you can sync that up with um, what you're going to be doing with the demultiplexer later. Uh, section two covers how to load a whole frame of data into the memory, like how that works on, on an electrical level. And section four uh, is about how to play the data out of it again. So if you actually look at how it tells you to do this, it comes in the form of a great riddle that looks like this. Um, some of you will be like, ah, oh, that's no problem. I have no issue with that. Some of you will be like, what is that? Um, but if you're not familiar with this, uh, these are just sort of, it's telling you these are four signals, the data clock, latch, uh, data in, and another type of clock. Um, the, the, the lines down below are a zero and the lines up above are a one. And so basically this is just telling you what the values of these lines need to be over time in order to send something. And so actually if you read the, sort of the words around this and you try and understand it, this is basically saying to send data in, you need to put it on the SDI line. You need to flip this like line called the declock for every bit of the data you're sending. And then when you're done sending one bit of data, you need to assert this other line called LE. And so that's basically the instructions of this like very confusing waveform diagram. And actually, um, I lied when I said this was like the whole thing. It, uh, it's actually much worse. Um, and there are like four of these for each of the sections. <laughs> so that took a while to understand. But um, the application note does actually tell you, like, if you can get past the, the confusing diagrams, it does actually tell you everything you need to know about how to communicate with the MBI 5153. But there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, there's sort of a lot to take in. And if you're going to actually try and translate this into code, it can be very confusing. So maybe your first instinct to write code for this might be to do something similar to what you might do in your like intro to Arduino programming, which is that you just say, oh, I'm going to set this pin low, and I'm going to set this pin high, and I'm going to maybe copy paste it a bit, and sort of make all these imperative commands to sort of drive the panel. And we could do this, but this is confusing and very hard to understand. And I was really, really afraid that I'd make some really, really catastrophically bad typo, or I'd like typo one of those Ds for a G and then spend like three days trying to find it. Um, so I had another idea which is that we could write code to generate um, what the output should be over time. So we could have a list of what the signal output should be at one time, and then what should come after that, and then what should come after that. Um, and this, t this type of thing, if you're familiar with sort of programming, is called an iterator. We could run that iterator for a bit. We could collect our results of what we think the signal should be over time. Um, and then we can compare that against what we're expecting from the data sheet so that we know our code is correct. So we can program in some test vectors that look exactly like the data sheet. Um, so if we've got a bit of Rust code over here, this is what the test looks like. Don't worry. You don't need to understand this. Um, we've just got our setup bit over here. We're going to send out the values 42 and 7. We're going to pass this into our panel state iterator that I've made, and it's going to generate that list of outputs over time. If we go back to our confusing waveform diagram and remember the steps that we need, the asserting the declock we, the, and the asserting LE, um, if we look at the test, we can actually see that this, this is something I've managed to transcribe. We can see the data 42 being, um, clock, uh, being sent out on the SDI line, and then we've got this data clock as well uh, for each bit with the uh, LE line being asserted at the end of the word. So this is like a nice way of doing this with, whilst keeping my sanity. We write iterators that provide like a list of signal outputs, and we can unit test them against what the application note says we should exist on those lines. And I haven't really talked that much about programming languages, and I'm not going to, but I just want to shout out Rust um, for making it very easy to write this sort of high-level code. I can write and I can test it using sort of higher-level programming. I can run it on my laptop, and then I can compile the same code for the microcontroller, and I know it's going to work because I've tested it on my laptop, and that's really nice. Um, um, so you can write a bunch of iterators. Here are the output of Rust doc. Uh, I've got some to handle switching the address lines. I've got some to, ha to handle switching the config. And I've got ha some to handle sending the frames. I've written some tests. I'm very proud of myself that they all pass. Um, and so then we can actually try and run this in theory. Uh, and we get some lovely glitch out um, when I forget to set, set the configuration register. Um, but if we're sending a test pattern of all ones in these lovely colors, we can see there we go. We can actually light the panel up. Um, this also quite nicely demonstrates how it's split into four mini panels. Those are where the boundaries sort of are. 
Um, and if we want to send something that's not all ones, uh, we can send you know, every other pixel on and off. That might be hard to see, but you can see that sort of test pattern. We've got some great gradients. And so basically, this has demonstrated that with this approach, we have full control of the panels in theory, even though it doesn't really look like it. And then I was pretty happy with this. Um, and I went home, and then sort of hyper-focus kicked in. I kind of lost track of time. And then like the next day, I woke up with this. Um, so this is... Uh, <laughs> This is the embedded graphics library for Rust. Um, and I basically just wired that up. That, that library provides a bunch of nice drawing primitives. And I've wired that up to the panel using my sort of control code. So I can basically just draw whatever I want. So I kind of win, right? I can draw a lovely, cute cat. And I can be very pleased with myself. Um, so uh, what have we done so far? We have understood the panel internals, how to drive the MBI 5153 chip. We've written a bunch of iterators in Rust that generate the signals. Uh, and then we've put that on the board. We've written a embedded graphics drawable for the panel so we can draw whatever we want. And this is just using like some bitmap files for now. So that's, that's already pretty good, right? We can drive the whole panel. Um, but there's still 10 minutes left. <laughs> what if it did more? What if it was faster? <laughs> Time to move on to stage three. <laughs> So what we've done so far is mostly entirely generic, uh, and it's also really slow, because I, was, I really just didn't want to do debugging. I prioritized correctness. Um, so I wrote some code that works basically on any microcontroller. You should be able to port this to any microcontroller that runs Rust, and that's actually pretty useful, and I encourage you to do that if you have some spare time. Um, but what if we didn't do that? Um, our development board here is using the RP2040 chip from Raspberry Pi. And it has a bunch of these really cool programmable I.O. blocks. Uh, this is a diagram from the data sheet. These are basically like really simple, really dumb computers that have like only two registers. They can communicate to the pins. They can communicate to the main CPU. But they really can't do much. They have like nine instructions. And here, they're, here, here they are. Jump, wait, in, out, push, pull, move, IRQ, and set. Very groovy. Um, so yeah, that we have four of these uh, per PIO block, and we've got two PIO blocks. Um, very limited instruction set, as I said. They can't do any maths. The only math they can do is x equals x minus 1 and invert. So like, actually getting these things to do things that are complicated is very hard. And they've also got limited instruction memory. So we only have 32 instructions per set of four PIO uh, state machines. But they are cycle accurate. If I write code that says, you know, set these pins on cycle one and set the other pins on cycle two, each instruction will only take one cycle to execute. Um, so it's very handy for doing sort of things that require accurate timing. They've got some handy features like side set and delay, um, where you can sort of set a pin while you're doing something else and stuff like that, and you can communicate to and from the main core. So actually, if you look at the data sheet, they have some examples where you can use this to implement a bunch of useful protocols, like the UART, uh, you know, some LEDs, um, I squared C, and stuff like that. They are usually programmed in this fancy custom assembly language that uh, Raspberry Pi people wrote, but I didn't want to learn that because I was bored and also lazy. Um, so I, you can just do it in Rust. There's a Rust crate for it, so I just did that. Um, but yeah, the generic implementation we have spends a lot of time sending out frames. Um, we have 12 shift registers to send to. We're kind of doing a lot of work for every shift register. It's not very, not very fast. So why don't we use our PIO block in our RP2040 microcontroller to optimize that part? If we do a little recap of that complicated diagram I showed earlier, um, where we've got all these tasks to do, we could like have a simple program that tries to do it, that basically just keeps track of like the number of bits left. Uh, if the bits, number of bits left is zero, we're going to set the latch high and refill it. Otherwise, we're going to set the latch low and decrement it. We're going to then do our output and pulse the data clock and stuff like that, and we're going to repeat. Um, so, yeah, um, but the problem is this won't work. We kind of have to like move it around to get it to stick. Um, we actually probably want to use a side set there to save an instruction. We've got to do a whole bunch of other stuff, so we can't really decrement. We have to actually do that as part of the if because of the weird instruction set. We can't really have variables. We've got to use the like, scratch register. So there's a whole bunch of changes you need to do. You also need to like, actually get stuff into this. It's very, it's very confusing and it's very annoying. It takes a lot of effort, but we can actually program for this quite successfully. We can use the iterators for scanner we can, uh, and vertical sync, and then we can use the PIO block to accelerate the frame sending. And that gets us like a moderate speed up. We can go from like two seconds for frame to like four frames a second, which is pretty good. Uh, but even with the speed up, we still end up doing a lot of work on the main cores. Uh, one core is permanently doing scanning out. Um, so I had this sort of crazy idea that what if we like offloaded everything to the RP2040 like programmable I/O? What if we freed up both of the main calls to do whatever they wanted, and they just had to send frames and a like vsync command? I could take all of my lovely iterators that I'd written in Rust, prioritizing correctness, and I could translate them all into PIO programs. 
And so I started doing this. The next thing I did was I, uh, so I had my frame sending program already. That's the thing I just sort of tried to demo. Uh, and then I also uh, wrote a program to do the switching of the address lines, which I'm going to call scan out. And so at this point, I just had the main CPU sending some frames and starting and scoping the scan out thing. So it was a, it's a mild speed up, but the CPU still has to do a lot of work. And a lot of that is because I didn't really think that the PIO um, programs could really be that autonomous. They always have to be driven by the CPU, unless um, I was looking at the instruction sets and I noticed that there are some very useful synchronization primitives. You can assert interrupt request lines and other sort of PIO blocks can wait on that. So you can actually have them do this kind of like fun synchronization dance where one of them checks that someone else has done something and the other one is waiting for it and you can like do all this communication. And so I have this very complicated diagram that you probably won't understand uh, that sort of outlines how I sort of configure four separate like mini PIO programs to uh, drive the panel with very minimal input from the CPU. And they're all talking to each other saying, you know, is this frame done? Can I do a vsync now? Have you done like sent, are you done pulsing this clock? Blah de blah de blah. And it's great fun. Um, and I mean, I, I sort of say this to gloss over a lot of technical details. There's lot, there were a lot of mishaps along the way. Uh, I generated a lot of cool glitch art. Uh, I had like the Ukraine flag kitty wave and like the cool posterized thing. I had the oh god, what the hell has gone wrong there? And the the sort of slightly glitchy no good cat. But at the end of my experimentation we managed to basically offload everything to the programmable I.O. block. So the main core only needs to send frames and a vertical sync. Um, it still has to prepare the frames, but like all the actual hard work of driving the panel can be completely offloaded from the main cores. Uh, this means the main core is free to do some other fun things. Uh, so to finish up, let's go over how we can sort of have some fun with this now that we've basically done all the hard work. I'm going to have another drink of water. Also didn't spill it on myself, go me. Um, so yeah, normal people want something they can actually plug and play to drive the panel with. They don't actually, we've, we've done an impressive technical accomplishment. We now need to do the rest of the work to make this into a product that you can use and take home. Um, so USB, the RP2040 has a USB peripheral. Uh, why not use it? We can send frames over USB so you can display arbitrary stuff from a computer. Initially, uh, I was just streaming the whole sort of set of data that the PIO needed from the computer, but it turns out this thing is only 12 megabits per second USB full speed. Um, the USB people have this really fun thing where they went straight from low speed to full speed and then didn't leave themselves much room for improvement. So now the new ones just have like increasingly more contrived names to try and convince you that it's faster. Um, so full speed isn't that fast. We get to use this thing called the quite okay image format uh, that is indeed quite okay. Um, and we can use that to compress. It's really easy to write stuff for. Um, so we, we, that's, that's, that can help us like get some, some greater frame rates. We can do like 30 frames a second bad apple, which is pretty impressive. Uh, there's actually a lot of engineering effort that came into making it do that, but I'm not going to cover it because I don't have time. Um, we can also um, go really push the boat out and have a fancy PCB made. Uh, so the first one we made had a few problems. It was also more development oriented. I really wanted to make a surface mount sort of pre-assembled one because I'd never done that before. So I sort of spent a whole week in KiCad drawing out this monstrosity that looks like this. We had it ordered and it came, this is like the key thing. We can get the PCB house to put the components on it so it arrives as a fully formed thing, which is really great, especially for all of you people who've just picked up one and might want to order something like this to make it work with minimal assembly. Um, Eva, uh, my, uh, my friend, also like built a prototype to drive many panels at once from a browser. Um, so sh because they use USB, you can use web USB, you can use Chrome. Uh, you can. She wrote some really impressive code to join multiple of them together to actually make a mini video wall to display stuff from a canvas. I've got some sort of screenshots of that. Here's her in front of a webcam, and that's being sent out to the panel. We managed to hook it up to the OBS virtual camera, and that was a fun time. You can see sort of displaying a webcam there and part of the, the screen. And... This is going to go great. I have so much confidence for this. Let's go. Uh, where is that terminal? Where's my mouse? Where's my mouse? Oh, it's time for another old tabbing. Oh, yeah. Right. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> So there we go, that's, that's 46 frames a second, um, which, no, you can't see because we switched the camera over, that's fine. We can also do something that, uh, that's sort of a bit of a pathological case for compression because it's actually got colors. But if we play something that doesn't have colors, 
uh, it can go a lot faster. This is more like 60 frames a second. This is the famous bad Apple test video uh, for other people um, who are interested in sort of displays. Uh, I'm going to blame the glitching on the power cable and not my code. <laughs> but yeah, that's basically it. Um, all right, I can't hit right because I'm in a terminal. Let's deal with that. Yeah, there we go. So, yes. Um, can we switch the thing back to the slides? Yay, thank you. Um, so yeah, there's some source code there. It's a QR code if you want to read all the gory details. It is actually somewhat commented. I did put a lot of effort into this. Um, there's my Mastodon and my email. Um, and I didn't really realize they were doing the swap shop thing until recently, but like, I gather maybe a lot of you will want to buy a driver board or at least get instructions for how to do that. If you are interested, uh, come and find me in the Q&A tent or something or just like hit me up on Mastodon and email. Uh, if enough of you sort of want to buy my boards, we can work something out, we can do a bulk order from the manufacturer, I can try and ship some, something out and be an uh, amazing e equipment manufacturing person. But yeah, that's about it from me. Thank you all for listening.